Welcome to the MCAT Basics Podcast, brought to you by the physicians at Med School Coach. Each week, Sam Smith breaks down high yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello, and welcome to Perspective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. This podcast covers social norms and deviance. The first thing I'll do is define those terms, and then I'll get into social norms and talk about the different types of social norms, including folkways, mores, taboos, and laws. And then I'll get into deviance. And I'll talk about some different perspectives on deviance, including things like labeling theory, strain theory, social disorganization theory, and more. And then last but not least, I'll talk about collective behavior and collective deviance. Good luck to those of you who are taking the MCAT soon, and I hope this podcast helps in your studies. Okay, so the first thing I want to do here is kind of define what social norms are and and what deviance is. And I'll start by defining normative versus non-normative behavior. So normative behavior is behavior that follows social norms, i.e. it's basically the expected behavior in a particular society. On the other hand, non-normative behavior is defined by the APA, the American Psychology Association, as not conforming to or reflecting an established norm, or deviation from a specific standard of comparison for a person or group of people, particularly a standard determined by cultural ideals of how things ought to be. In other words, non-normative behavior is just behavior outside the norms of a society. And so that brings me to kind of my next definition, or maybe what you're wondering, which is what is a norm? So a social norm is the informal or formal rules that govern behavior in groups and societies. And I'll get into some examples of norms and some different types of norms, but just understand that general definition for now. And then deviance is just the breaking of these social norms or non-normative behavior. So any behavior that goes against a social norm is considered deviant behavior. So with that said, let me dive deeper into social norms. So as I said, a norm is an informal or formal rule that governs behavior in groups and societies. And these are rules that a particular society has defined as either good, right, or important. And I really want to emphasize that word particular because social norms really depend upon which society you live in. They're relative. And I think Einstein summed it up best when he said, quote, I do not see any reason to assume that the heuristic significance of the principle of general relativity is restricted to gravitation. It can be applied to social norms. Anyways, this is all a long-winded way of saying that social norms are very dependent upon the society you're looking at and they're relative to that society. Thanks, Albert Einstein, for illuminating that. Okay, so norms can either be informal or formal. Informal norms are unwritten rules that govern the behavior of society, whereas formal norms are well-established written rules that can be legally established. Now, there are two types of informal norms that I want to talk about. They are folkways and mores. And then after I talk about those, I'll get into taboos and laws, which actually have quite a bit of overlap. So folkways are informal norms that are rules and norms that are expected to be followed but are not considered to be of moral significance. In other words, breaking a folkway is really not that big of a deal. For example, if I were to receive a text call email from a friend or family member, I would definitely be expected at some point to reply maybe with like in 24 hours. So I would say that's kind of a folkway, right? That's an unwritten rule that, okay, if I receive a call or an email or a text, I'm going to text back within 24 hours. However, if I don't do that, it's really not the end of the world, right? It's not immoral if I don't do that. Another folk way, and this one is kind of funny actually, is how we all stand in an elevator. So when you get in an elevator, the first thing you do is turn around 
and you face the door. That's what you, what you do, right? You face away from everybody else in the elevator. However, if you were to break that norm and be deviant, you would be standing in the elevator facing everybody, which <laughs> would be weird as shit, but also it would be kind of funny and sounds like a YouTube prank or something like that. But anyways, that's a folk way, right? Because that's, it's a norm that everyone follows, but if you were to break it, you might be considered weird, but nobody would say you're not a moral person because you're facing the wrong way in an elevator. Now, mores, on the other hand, are another informal norm, but are defined as norms of morality in a society. So if you break a more, it's often considered offensive to most of the people in that particular culture. In the American culture, and I think in a lot of cultures, faithfulness to a spouse, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, is considered a more, right? When somebody cheats on a spouse, that is seen as something that is immoral. And, you know, the whole culture in the U.S. specifically identifies that behavior as immoral. And it's not necessarily a written law, right? There's no laws against adultery. However, it is seen as immoral. Now, taboos are similar to mores, only stronger. That's kind of how I like to think about them. So taboos are strong norms in society. And breaking a taboo often results in banishment from society and is looked upon with extreme disgust. For example, incest is a taboo in many societies. And this is where I'll get into some cultural differences in norms, specifically in taboos. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. It's a complicated process, and even students with great grades and MCAT scores get left out. That's why more students than ever are turning to Med School Coach for admissions advising. Our advisors are all physicians and former admissions committee members, so they know exactly what medical schools are looking for. One-on-one -on -one admissions advising from Med School Coach makes all the difference. Our expert team will help you develop a game plan, prepare your application, edit your essays, and coach you for interviews. Every pre-med has a story, and we'll help you tell it so you can stand out from the crowd. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10%, up to $400, on a Med School Coach admissions advising package. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and Med School Coach can help. In some cultures, eating certain foods is considered taboo. So, for instance, the Hindus don't eat beef, and eating beef is considered a taboo. In the Muslim religion, pork is viewed as a taboo food. And then last but not least, traditional Jews keep kosher, and so eating foods that are not kosher is considered a taboo. Another interesting taboo that depends on the culture is cannibalism. So obviously in the U.S., cannibalism is not okay. Shout out Jeffrey Dahmer. But there are places in the world where cannibalism is actually okay. This is mainly in small remote tribes like the Azmat, which is a tribe that's native to New Guinea Island, and the Angori, which is a group of religious monks in India. But again, I'm just trying to show here that these norms depend upon the society that you're looking at. So, you know, we in America don't view that as okay, but Again, we live in our own certain culture, and we have our own norms, and those norms may not apply to other cultures. Now, I hope what you've been wondering as I talk about taboos and mores is how do they intersect with law? So as I said, mores and folkways are informal norms. They're unwritten rules. Laws, on the other hand, are formal written norms. And through legislation, these mores and these taboos can actually become laws. With that said, there's quite a bit of overlap between taboos and laws. Some of the taboos I mentioned are actually laws. And I shouted out Jeffrey Dahmer because he was actually a serial killer who killed, I think, like 18 or 19 young men and um, actually committed cannibalism too, which is horrific. But What's interesting is he actually is in prison now. And I guess it's not interesting, it's good, right? He's a serial killer, he is in prison. But what's interesting to me actually is that cannibalism is not necessarily illegal in the US. It's only illegal in one state, which is Idaho. However, 
the means to commit cannibalism are actually what's illegal. So for instance, Jeffrey Dahmer murdered these people and then committed cannibalism. So the murder in itself is what was illegal. And so you could also say that murder is a taboo, right? It, it is looked upon with extreme disgust in society, but it's also a law. When I was talking about taboos, I also briefly mentioned incest. And incest is actually illegal in most states. It's a crime. So overall, laws are formalized written norms, and they help enforce these important norms that are taboos in society. So I'd say the relationship between norms and laws are, are really close, right? Social norms essentially underlie our laws. So before I get into deviance, let me quickly summarize these norms. So folkways and mores are informal norms. Folkways are norms that are expected to be followed, but if you break them, no big deal. Mores are norms of morality. So if you break a more, it's considered offensive to most people in that culture. And then taboos are the strongest norm. You break a taboo, this results in banishment from society sometimes and is looked upon with extreme disgust. And then lastly, laws are formalized written norms that are usually taboos that are enforced. All right, the next thing I want to talk about here is breaking social norms. So breaking a social norm is considered deviant behavior or, or deviance. Now there's a term that's related to deviance. It's a little bit different. It's anime. As I said, deviance refers to breaking an established social norm. Anime refers to the absence or breakdown of norms, rules, or even laws. An anime or anime theory was actually developed by the famous French sociologist Emile Durkheim. He believed that suicide resulted from the breakdown or loss of social norms, which had left people feeling hopeless and basically unconnected to society. And according to Durkheim, this occurs during and follows periods of drastic and rapid changes to the structure of society. And one thing this actually reminds me of is Twitter. So in real life, when you're face-to-face -face interacting with people, it's a norm that you act kindly and you respect people, you respect their opinions, you know, and you're not essentially an asshole to them. However, in Twitter, those social norms have been thrown out the window. In other words, the platform has eroded or broken down some of the social norms that we're used to. And this is anime. And when I go on Twitter, I can tell you that essentially Twitter to me is like taking a syringe, filling it with anxiety, and then just injecting it straight into your bloodstream, basically. And I do think in some respects that being on Twitter for too long can actually leave people feeling hopeless and maybe unconnected to society. So that's an interesting example that I thought of. And, you know, as much as I talk shit about Twitter, I still am on it fairly often. So, um, yeah. Okay, so again, anime is just the breakdown or loss of social norms. Now let me get into deviance, which is violating established social norms. Now, deviance could be something as simple as breaking a folkway, like standing the wrong way in an elevator, or it could be as serious as breaking a law or taboo, like Jeffrey Dahmer committing murder. So just keep in mind that deviant behavior doesn't just have to be something really, really bad that can send you to jail. Okay, so there are six perspectives or theories that I want to talk about that try to explain deviant behavior. And this is good stuff for the MCAT, so... Um, if you were to listen to any part of this podcast, let it be this one. And I'm going to talk about labeling theory, differential association, strain theory, social disorganization theory, cultural deviance theory, and then last, I'll talk about social bond theory. Labeling theory. Labeling theory says that deviance is not an inherent tendency of an individual. Instead, it says that deviant behavior is only deviant because it's labeled so by society. Moreover, it says that the labeling of deviant behavior as deviant actually causes an individual to exhibit more deviant behavior. For example, take someone, let's call them a student, that is trying to be safe and decides to ride their bike home from a party instead of drive their car home. On the way home, though, they're stopped by a police officer 
who gives them a breathalyzer test, finds out that they're actually still intoxicated, and they're arrested for DUI. And actually, in some places, you can actually be arrested for a DUI um, if you're riding a bike drunk. Now, the labeling theory would say that riding a bike under the influence of alcohol is only a deviant behavior because society says it is. Further, this person would go to jail, and then they would be labeled as deviant, right? The word would get around that they got a DUI, and people would start thinking of them differently. And because of this, they would internalize this view and say to themselves, maybe I really am a bad person or a criminal. And then this internalization of others' view of them would lead them to further deviant behavior and to commit further crimes. And this process of forming a deviant identity actually has a few terms that go with it. So it has the terms primary deviance and secondary deviance. The primary deviance is engaging in the initial act of deviance. This is riding the bike drunk. And then the second and then secondary deviance refers to the process of internalizing a deviant identity and then potentially acting deviant again in the future because of this identity. And this labeling theory has aspects of both symbolic interactionism and social constructionism, which are more broad sociological theories. Differential association theory. Differential association theory says that individuals base their behaviors by association and interaction with others. Basically, it says that all deviant behavior is learned from others. Back to my biking example, this theory would say that the student engaged in this deviant behavior because they either observed this exact behavior from maybe their friends or other behaviors like it. And as a result, they were able to rationalize their own behavior. Well, Johnny did it and he was okay. This is much safer than when Kyle drives home from the party. And this theory of differential association has aspects of both Bandura's social learning theory and symbolic interactionism. Strain theory. Strain theory says that social structures within society pressure citizens to become deviant and commit crimes. And typically this theory looks at disadvantaged groups. It says that people in disadvantaged communities may not be able to reach their goals the way that society is currently structured, and as a result feel stress or strain. And so what they do is they turn to crime in order to reach the goals that they have for themselves. And these goals could be wealth, it could be a nice house, comfortable lifestyle, etc. Now going back to the example of the student we've been talking about, let's just say that this student works full-time on top of school in order to pay for their tuition. And it puts that person in some financial strain. And so when they're going home from the party, they're trying to decide whether or not to pay for an Uber or just to walk or to bike, but you know, walking's too far and they don't want to spend the money for the Uber because they don't feel like they can afford to do that. And so they take their bike instead. And this is a little bit of a stretch, obviously, but you could say then that it's the pressure that society puts on this student to pay for expensive college by themselves that made them commit this deviant act. Obviously, that's a bit of a stretch and a little bit unrealistic, but that would be kind of be how you apply the strain theory lens to this example. And in terms of the broader sociological perspective that this strain theory falls under, it falls under the functionalist perspective because the strain theory can be used to argue that essentially deviance is normal in a society and serves a function, right? It serves to challenge people's views and change policy to make society more egalitarian. Social disorganization theory. Social disorganization theory was developed by researchers at the University of Chicago in the 1920s and 1930s. And it asserts that crime is most likely to occur in communities with weak social ties where there is an absence of social control. In simpler terms, it says that a lack of community, community relationships, residential instability, and neighborhood segregation all contribute to creating deviant behavior. As authors Rebecca Wicks and Michelle Snides put it, this theory shifts criminology scholarship from a focus on the pathology of people to the pathology of places. And typically this theory is used to look at youth crime in poor communities. So our example of the student is 
a bit of a stretch again, but still, let's just look at how social disorganization theory would look at this example. So let's just say that the student from our example grew up in a disadvantaged neighborhood, and as a result, maybe they didn't have the mentorship or community relationships that would have made them an individual that understands the wrongness of biking home drunk after a party. And again, that's a bit of a stretch, but basically the social disorganization theory looks at community and all these different factors of an individual, you know, growing up in what their environment was like and how that may have contributed to the crime. And like strain theory, this falls under the functionalist perspective. Cultural deviance theory. Cultural deviance theory is a combination of both the strain and social disorganization theory. It was developed by two researchers in the 1940s and says that deviance is a result of conforming to lower class norms. Basically, it says that because the lifestyle in a disadvantaged poor community is extremely frustrating and draining, members create their own subculture with its own rules, values, and norms. They go on to say that the middle class culture emphasizes hard work, delayed gratification, and education, while these disadvantaged poor communities have a subculture that emphasizes excitement, toughness, fearlessness, immediate gratification, and, quote, street smarts. So in short, this theory says that accepting norms in the lower class communities that are different than other communities leads to deviant behavior. So if we were to take this lens and look at the example of the student, this would say that this student came from a disadvantaged community, and as such, they are instilled with norms that are unique to the community, like biking under the influence of alcohol. And like social disorganization theory and cultural deviance theory, this perspective falls under the umbrella functionalist perspective. Social control theory. In contrast to the other theories I've already talked about, social control theory explains why people obey rules and are not deviant. It says that an individual's internalization of good values, morals, and norms in their relationship with others leads them to non-deviant behavior. At Med School Coach, we know that studying for the MCAT exam can be challenging, especially for busy students on the go. That's why our team created MCAT Prep, the only all-encompassing study app built specifically for the MCAT. MCAT Prep by Med School Coach provides student access to extremely high-quality content and a personalized curriculum for free. The app has more than 250 videos, 1,000 flashcards, and 1,000 unique MCAT questions. Plus, MCAT Prep by Med School Coach allows students to create a personalized study schedule and track progress over time. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into medical school, and now you can put the experts from Med School Coach into your pocket. It's the closest pre-med students can come to a personal tutor without spending a penny. Download MCAT Prep by Med School Coach for free at medschoolcoach.com slash MCAT, or download it directly from the Apple Store or Google Play Store. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and MCAT Prep by Med School Coach can help. Because of this definition, it says that deviant behavior is a result of individuals losing connection with society and losing connection with their own values and morals. Further, it says that we act within norms because we are controlled by two factors. One is external controls and the other is internal controls. External controls are things like friends, family, the police, community. Internal controls are things like embarrassment, conscience, and desire to receive approval from others. These two controls essentially keep us from committing deviant behavior in crimes. So let's look at the example of the student again. This theory would say that external controls like parents might tell the student, Biking while intoxicated is not good for your safety. Or friends at the party may have gone up to the student who's their friend and said, hey, let's not do this. Let's not bike home while you're drunk. You know, you could get a DUI, um, blah, 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 and kept the student from doing so. So those would be external controls that keep the student from committing deviant behavior. Internal controls, on the other hand, would be like the student's realization that a DUI charge comes with shame and embarrassment, 
or you know the act itself might be too embarrassing for the student to do at the time. They don't want to be ostracized by their friends later on, you know, telling them, "Hey, what you did wasn't okay." They just might not want to hear that later on. So that might be enough to keep them from committing this deviant behavior, this crime. However, in our example, the student's connection with family, community, their friends, and their own morals and feelings were not enough to keep them off the bike, and therefore they committed this deviant behavior. So overall, the social control theory takes more of an individualized look at why we do or do not commit crimes. And this is in contrast to other theories we talked about earlier, which kind of take more of a systematic approach or a systematic look at why individuals commit crimes. To me, the social control theory puts more of an emphasis or blame on the individual. And in terms of the broader sociological theory that this falls under, to me it seems like it falls under more of the rational choice theory as well as a little bit of symbolic interactionism. So that's really it for deviance. In terms of the MCAT, I would know how to apply these different theories and I know their definitions. If you have to, put them on note cards, memorize them, but be able to actually apply them. You know, practice looking through the lens of the cultural deviance theory or strain theory or so on. So the last thing I want to talk about in this podcast, and it's kind of a short bit, is on collective behavior and collective deviance. So in terms of collective behavior and collective deviance, there's a few terms I want to talk about. I want to talk about fads, mass hysteria, and then riots. In trying to find a sociological definition for a fad, I came across a paper in the American Sociology Review that defined a fad as the following, quote, a non-traditional preoccupation by diffuse collective on a circumscribed object or process, end quote. And I imagine the person who wrote this did so while they were drinking their Earl Grey tea in their Manhattan apartment with their purebred French bulldog. Um, now, I think it's, you know, one of, one of the problems in science and, you know, obviously here in the softer sciences too, is disseminating information in a way that other people can understand. Obviously, that definition is as good as alphabet soup to me. I have no idea what it, what it means. So instead, I looked on Wikipedia, and it defines fad as any form of collective behavior that develops within a culture, a generation, or social group in which a group of people enthusiastically follow an impulse for a finite period of time. In other words, it's a trend that only lasts for a short period of time, like, for instance, frosted tips in the 2000s. And so at the most basic level, fads affect collective behavior but only for very short periods of time. Next, mass hysteria refers to widespread fear and concern that turns out to be false, overblown, or at least greatly exaggerated. And there's a great story that kind of illustrates this, and it was in 1938 when Orson Welles, who was eventually a filmmaker, performed a radio drama with the title The War of the Worlds. And this was a radio broadcast that was apparently live on Halloween, and it was presented as a typical evening of radio programming basically being interrupted by a series of news bulletins saying that there had been an explosion on Mars, and now there was some object that was falling towards a farm in New Jersey. And of course, this radio program was just a script that was being read by Orson Welles and a few other voice actors. But what happened is that people tuned into this radio broadcast and thought that it was real and that there were actually Martians like attacking and killing people. And as you could imagine, this caused a mass hysteria. You know, phone lines and electricity suffered a short circuit because so many people were trying to make phone calls. And according to Radio Lab, which is a great podcast, by the way, about 12 million people were listening to Wells's broadcast when it first aired. And about one in every 12 thought that it was true and that some percentages of that one million people ran out of their homes and were just hysterical. Now, the connection between mass hysteria and deviance is fairly clear, right? You can see that 
if there is an event that causes mass hysteria, people are going to tend to ignore social norms and act deviantly. Now, there's a type of mass hysteria called moral panic that you should also know about. This is widespread concern or fear over a perceived threat to the moral order that's either false or greatly exaggerated. An example of this is the legalization of marijuana. There are groups of people that tend to see marijuana as immoral, and they'll freak out and think, okay, this marijuana is going to cause the whole next generation of youth's brains to rot. And that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but I think there are groups of people who view marijuana as being immoral and maybe think it might ruin society. And so that would be an example of moral panic, since as we know, marijuana does not in fact destroy society. So in short, moral panic is essentially like mass hysteria, but the freak out is about some moral issue. All right, last but not least, I want to talk about riots. So riots are relatively spontaneous outbursts of violence or disturbances of peace by a large group of people. And riots usually occur in reaction to some grievance, a perceived grievance, or out of dissent. For example, in the United States currently, we are seeing riots that are occurring in response to the death of people of color at the hand of police officers. And historically speaking, riots have always occurred, or at least in terms of recorded history. For instance, in 44 BC, the assassination of Julius Caesar actually stimulated a riot. So this is just to say that riots have been going on since the beginning of recorded history, obviously up until now. And it's pretty obvious that riots can result in deviant behavior, right? In riots, people burn buildings, they're violent. Um, in some cases, people are murdered. And, these are n and that's not normal behavior. Um, that actually breaks social norms, hence it is deviant. So that's just a little intro into collective behavior and collective deviance. Let me quickly try to just summarize this in like a sentence. Fads are short trends. Mass hysteria is something where everyone freaks out about nothing. And then riots are outbursts of violent behavior after a grievance. That does it for this episode of MCAT Basics. As always, thanks for listening to the podcast. If you like what we do, please go give us a five-star review on iTunes. It helps us in the rankings, and it helps us pop up first when people search the term MCAT into whatever podcast player they're listening to. Hence, it helps people find us easier. If you come across any errors in any of these episodes, I'm obviously not perfect, so please just shoot me an email. I've had plenty of people do this, and then I go back into the episodes and either leave a comment in the show notes or I'll go back and re-record over a segment. So always feel free to do that. And thanks again for listening. Each episode of MCAT Basics is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including MCAT tutoring and medical school admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for the MCAT, and we hope you tune in again next time.